What's going on fam? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football channel. As always, it's your boy Nick coming at you with another video. We're going to get into the second installment of my fantasy team outlooks for the season. Going 32 teams, every team, position by position, until we hit them all. One team, everyone knows the rules. Our last episode was the New York Giants. Thus, we're going to stay in the NFC East Coast and hit the Washington Redskins. A very intriguing team going into this year. I first want to say thank you to our sponsors, Monster. They're totally not our sponsors, but I fudging love Monster. And I'm hoping that if I put out enough videos and keep saying that they're my sponsor, that maybe one of you guys has a connection or one of you guys works for Monster. And thus, you're going to use me as a marketer for you. Hear me out. This is an untapped market for energy drinks. Tell me not. Fantasy football industry is on the way up. There's a huge amount of players. And it's like nerds who are in the computer who stay up late researching shit. What better way to market your brand than using energy drink for this type of industry? So I'm just gonna throw that piece in there before every single video and hope eventually something hits. We're gonna hit the Washington Redskins, starting out the quarterbacks, run through the wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, every single thing fantasy relevant is coming your way. Go follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the newsletter on my blog, and subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up. Everything will be linked below that I talk about in this video if you're interested. So let's get rolling, 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 what? As always, we're gonna start off with the quarterback and we have Kirk Cousins. They hit him with that franchise tag. They slapped him with it. Doesn't look like a long-term deal is gonna get done. I don't know why, I don't know what Washington's waiting for. He had a huge season in 2016. There's not many franchise quarterbacks that fall into your lap and you're not gonna pay them. He threw for the third most passing yards in the NFL. It was over 4,900 yards, I think 49-17. He threw for 25 scores, ran in four scores, and finished as fantasy's fifth best quarterback. You know, I was pumping him all off season. He was one of my best value plays at quarterback. And it looks like he's gonna be the best value play at quarterback again going into 2017. And it's not that his volume was so high, right? He had all those passing yards, but his, he was super efficient too. He was sixth in the NFL in um, completion percentage per aim throw. So his aim throw percentage was really high. And he goes into the 2017 season with one of the best pass blocking offensive lines. They were the third ranked third best ranked pass blocking line in the nfl as per football outsiders so he's got all the pieces around him he's got good blocking he's got a great arm and he's getting picked at qb 11 right now in fantasy which is like it's like 50 picks behind a guy like drew Brees. and when we get to if you watch my bus video i'll explain why i'm down on Brees this year but i love kirk where he's at extreme value another good year for him for sure for fantasy he'll be a late round quarterback for me in a lot of my leagues so this brings us over to the wide receivers who's kirk going to be throwing the ball obviously they lost to sean jackson to tampa bay they lost pierre garçon to the 49ers you might look at those guys and say like hey they're good players they're good role players but are they really that big of a piece of this offense and they were both thousand yard receivers, both over a hundred targets in this offense. So there's a lot of opportunity left on the board there for the receivers in this offense. And I'll tell you what, man, Terrell Pryor is my guy this year. I think I'm gonna go down with the ship. He's gonna make or break probably all my fantasy teams this year. And I'm saying that because I love him. I think he finishes as a wide receiver one there in Washington this year. In his first real year as a wide receiver, last year in Cleveland, he caught 77 balls, had over a thousand yards, scored four times. And he finished as wide receiver 21. So a legit wide receiver two. In Cleveland. So what was he working with? We had Josh McCowan and Robert Griffin III. Now Josh McCowan finished as 24th in bad pass percentage and RG3 finished as 36th among quarterbacks in bad pass percentage. He moves over to Kirk Cousins who was the sixth lowest in terms of bad pass percentage in the NFL. So he moves over from two shitty terrible just awful quarterbacks right to one of the more accurate throwers that throws the ball a lot and for a lot of yards. Cleveland averaged over 16 points a game. He's moving to the Redskins who average around 25 points a game. Where I see the opportunity, I see the opportunities everywhere. First off, Terrell Pryor had only, let me see, he had four targets inside the 10 yard line last year. That's the same amount as guys like Bryce Butler, Deontay Thompson, Chris Conley out of Kansas City, like no names, guys who 
don't do shit and throw up fire at just as many targets inside the 10. So that number's gotta go up. So I'm not really worried about that touchdown total at all. And Kirk Cousins has a lot of room to improve on that 25 passing touchdowns. You see guys that throw for 4,800 to 5,000 yards, normally their touchdown totals are from like 33 to 38 in that range. So I see a, a lot of potential for both parties to move up there. Terrell Pryor, obviously, you know, he's a huge target standing around 6'3", is now a really, really good, legitimate red zone threat. Last year, they were throwing a guys, you know, like Jordan Reed was injured and he's still undersized at the tight end. They had Deshaun Jackson on the outside. They had Pierre Garçon, all undersized guys who don't who don't have that fade, that that uh, capability in them, and now they do in Terrell Pryor. And with them losing to Sean Jackson, they also lose that, like, the bomb role, you know? The guy who shoots out Hail Marys, the guy who just runs post routes, who runs all day. Now, Terrell Pryor is not only going to be a good receiver on the outside, a red zone threat, running regular routes, but he's also that deep threat in this offense now. So last season, among all wide receivers in the NFL with at least 90 targets, Pryor had the third highest average depth of target of 15.5 yards behind only Mike Evans and, ironically, Deshaun Jackson. So it's not like Pryor's being forced into this role. This is a, a, a role and these are the targets that he already gets. I wanna leave you with this stat. This is something you need to take away here. If you're gonna take away anything from the Terrell Pryor bit that I've been yelling into the camera about for the last eight minutes. In 2016, Terrell Pryor was targeted on 32 downfield targets. Downfield means, I, th I believe it means 20 or 25 yards or more. And these stats are per PFF, Pro Football Focus. In 2016, Terrell Pryor was targeted on 32 downfield targets. Only nine of them were deemed catchable by PFF. Pryor caught eight of nine, eight of nine of those targets. In 2016, Deshaun Jackson, who was on the skins getting balls from Kirk Cousins, saw the same exact number of downfield targets, 32, but 18 of them were deemed catchable. So now he's moving over from nine catchable balls to 18. And considering he caught eight of nine, his percentage is also, you know, is still gonna stay high. So he has so much opportunity. He's not gonna see those same 140 targets that he did in Cleveland last year, but the efficiency that he, he'll get out of those targets is gonna be so much higher and it's going to play such a big role in, in how he produces on an efficiency level, man. Like I can't understate how big, I can't overstate how big this change in quarterback and scenery is for Pryor and his talent. And obviously, Terrell Pryor is not uh, not the only pass catcher here in Washington. Their head coach, John, Jay Gruden, talked a lot about this offseason about improving in the red zone. And they, they want to be able to, you know, pass the ball in there, get in, get in the end zone a lot more than they, they did last year. As I was talking about, Kirk's 25 touchdown passes. So what they did is they basically turned the receiving corps into one of the biggest or the bigger a uh, group of guys in the league. Now they have Terrell Pryor at like 6'4", 6'5". Brian Quick, they brought in through free agency, 6'3". And then they have their first round pick from last year, Josh Doxson coming back from injury, from his Achilles injury, who's 6'2". So they have a total change of scenery when it comes to the weapons on the outside. And of course they have Jordan Reed there, um, who's undersized as a tight end, but overall is still a big dude at like 6'2", 6'3". There hasn't been any news about Brian Quick. I highly doubt he'll, he'll really ever move up the ranks there. So the most intriguing guys wide receiver wise would be Terrell Pryor, then you have Jameson Crowder, and then you have Josh Doxson, the rookie. So I, I wanna talk about Jameson Crowder for a second. So Crowder's 23 years old, a little pint size, a little, little Ben Jerry's guy. He had a nice little breakout season last year. He caught 67 balls for 847 yards and seven touchdowns. He went over 100 receiving yards three different times. And he's a really, really, really just productive slot receiver. Really good value in PPR. He's going, let me bring up some ADPs. I should have had the ADPs in here already, but I wrote these a few weeks back before like any of the ADP data kind of came out. So let us see. Yep. So. Kirk is going 104th overall behind Marcus Mariota. That's ridiculous. Pryor is 39 overall, wide receiver 21. He's getting drafted where he finished last year, which is crazy. I'll take Terrell Pryor over who's going ahead of him. Devontae Adams is going ahead of him. Yep. Uh, Jarvis Landry. Yep. Alshon Jeffrey. Yep. I'll probably take him over Keenan Allen and Sammy Watkins too. I'll take him over all those guys. So I'll be reaching for Pryor in a lot of the leagues. Um, we have Crowder. Wow, Crowder's going pretty, pretty damn early. Crowder's going 59th overall at wide receiver 29. So I'm not going to say I'm comfortable taking him there, to be honest with you. Um, over the last five games of Washington's season last year, he averages 2.4 receptions and 24 receiving yards. So there's definitely some inconsistency there, which is not something you want to see out of a slot receiver. You want to see like those six for 65, seven for 82 games on a consistent basis. They're not guys that will get in the end zone because of their size, but you need to see those catches and those total yards. And those numbers are not going to get it done for me at wide receiver 
what was it, 28? Let me see who's going around him. Dante Moncrief's going ahead of him. I'd probably take Moncrief over him. But you have Martavis Bryant, Amir Abdullah, Brandon Marshall is going after Jameson Crowder. Like, I can't co-sign that. I'm sorry, Jameson. All right, so let's talk about the uh, rookie, last year's rookie, Josh Doxson. He's the 22nd overall pick by them in 2016. Uh, he only got on the field for two different games because of the Achilles injury. He managed 66 yards. He's looking to be a major piece of this red zone offense. They brought him in because he's great jumping ability, really good hands, and he's a guy that you're going to be able to throw fades to, so they can go Pryor's way, they can go Doxon's way. It's going to be really hard to cover them down there. And like I said, like D-Jax is gone, Pierre Garçon is gone. It's a ton of targets, it's a ton of yards, a ton of opportunity. Josh Doxon could very well go into this year as, as a big player in their offense, and he's going as 120th overall wide receiver 47. So definitely, so definitely some value, definitely a lot of upside there. Something were to happen to Terrell Pryor, he would automatically become the, the, you know, the number one on the outside in Washington, which is a really valuable position right now, in my opinion. Um, so Doxon's a guy who's going a little later, and someone that I'm definitely worth, uh, definitely worth taking a flyer on in the, you know, 11th, 12th, 13th round. Uh, I have a feeling he's going to be moving up a little bit more as the uh, as the summer goes by, but I like Doxon. I like what I see on film. I like him as a player. So the most productive pass catcher in this offense over the last few years hasn't been a wide receiver, hasn't been a running back. It's been Jordan Reed at the tight end position. He obviously had a disappointing year last year for those who picked him in the fourth round or even earlier in their fantasy drafts. Here's my takeaway. It's very much like the Rob Gronkowski, Gon -grunk, -grunk 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 Gronkowski situation. He played in 12 games last year and he's yet to play in a full 16 game season. However, when he's on the field, he's just an animal. He was the number one tight end on a points per game, a fantasy points per game basis last year. So when he played, he was an animal. And that that 12 games is, is including two games where he was basically just a decoy, where he had just one catch in those. So even with those games bringing him down, he was still the number one tight end on a points per game basis in PPR leagues. Over the last two seasons in games, he played at least 30, 3% of the team snaps. Reed has averaged 17.7 fantasy points per game and 8.3 targets per game. For perspective, last season's number one tight end averaged 13.8 fantasy points per game and 7.1 targets per game per PFF. So again, it's just coming down to the fact that how comfortable are you taking a risk on Reed? Because when he's playing, he's, an, he's a monster. Redskins coach Jake Gruden came out and said the offense runs through Jordan Reed. Uh, his, his numbers should follow that accordingly. He still should get a ton of targets when he's playing. He's 42nd overall, um, tight end. He's actually tight end three right now off the board, which is surprising. See, this is, the, this is why I like a guy like Jordan Reed, because you have Gronkowski going 22nd overall, then you have Travis Kels, Kelsey going 37th, and then you have Jordan Reed 42nd. So rather than, if you're gonna take a risk on a guy, don't take Gronk at 20 or 22, wait two rounds, pick up some running backs, pick up some wide receivers, and then get Jordan Reed. So my mindset when it comes to tight ends is very much like quarterbacks. It's all about the value. The drop off from the top guys, like from one, two to three, is not that valuable in terms of points per game basis. So if you could wait another round, and then another, and then another, and then another one, and then another one, do that. Don't take Gronk at 20 when you can get Jordan Reed at 40. But I, do, I really like Reed this year, again, as always. Not, not, too, not too hard of an analysis. So we get over to the running back situation. There, this is where things get very sticky. Going into the season, you know, everyone and their mother knew Matt Jones was the guy there in Washington. Well, welcome to fantasy football where the only thing you know is that you don't know shit. I literally learned that, like, by the time, the more I play fantasy football, the more I feel like I nothing matters, like no analysis matters, it's literally just a coin flip. He played well last year, he actually had 4.64 yards per carry, which is good, but he fumbled it, let me see, he fumbled it six times. He's fumbled it six times in 20 games, and he was actually a healthy scratch over the last eight games of the season, and all the, all the reports and the rumors coming out are basically like, they're, they've moved on from Matt Jones this offseason, he's not gonna be a part of their plan. So he's, he's out of the picture. So you enter undrafted free agent Rob Kelly, it's K-E-L-L-E-Y, not to be confused with Kelly Slater, K-E-L-L-E-E-E. -E -E. Over the skin's final nine games, when Matt Jones wasn't around, Rob Kelly averaged 18 touches a game. Uh, he finished with 780 total yards, seven total touchdowns. So a really good outing for Rob Kelly, a really big pickup for fantasy players midway through the season. It's still tricky there because Jay Gruden has not really given him a vote of confidence this offseason. 
They want him to compete for the job. They're not sold on him being the guy there. But what I do like is the fact that uh, a report just came out today that he dropped his body fat percentage from 18% to 13%. Which for a lot of people, they might kind of shake that off and like whatever every running back says that. But for the guys who've actually done that, when you look back historically over the last like five, seven years, you look at what it did for someone like Le'Veon Bell, where his rookie season, he really struggled. He dropped the body weight and then he just became incredibly elusive. And, and that kind of stuff happens when you start to drop body fat. Wow. Okay, so basically the offseason was filled with reports and rumors of how Redskins wanted to add another back. They didn't get one through for agency. They drafted someone. They drafted Samaje Perrine. I think I'm saying that right. And Perrine actually played with Joe Mixon at Oklahoma, the much less talented back. When you watch the two on film, it's like Joe Mixon here, Samaje here. You might remember Samaje. He had that like 437 yard game where he broke the record in a single game for college rushing yards. The week after, Melvin Gordon ran for like 408 yards and then the next week, Samaj Perrine ran for like a, a little bit more than him and broke the record. So that's that guy, if, if you remember that. He was picked 114th overall. He's 5'11", about 235 pounds. So he's a big, powerful back. He doesn't have breakaway, uh, breakaway speed. He's not like super athletic. And in my opinion, I definitely don't think he comes in and steals the job from Rob Kelly. I, I definitely think he's more of a change of pace back. There's reports, you know, random beat report, uh, reporters like they expect Perrine to be the starter week one. I don't think so. Uh, there's been no bad reports about Rob Kelly that have come out recently. And I, I think I think Rob Kelly's definitely the starter here. I think he's gonna be on a short leash. So that should be interesting as the summer goes on. And they have the third back in Chris Thompson, one of the most underrated players on the team, if not in the league. He is that Shane Vereen type back. He is that Gio Bernard type back. He's just a really, really, really good receiving back. He's just 26 years old. Last season, he finished with 49 catches, 705 total yards, and five touchdowns. For a guy that you can get for free, that's great for PPR. He, he actually finished as RB28 in PPR leagues, um, and that was 10 spots higher than Rob Kelly. Obviously, he didn't play in the full plethora of games, but it tells you something that he's got value nonetheless. What I think happens is this. Rob Kelly is the early down guy, the goal line guy. Samaje steals some carries early. Uh, Kelly's on a tight leash. If he can, if he can be productive early on, I don't think he loses that job. And then Chris Thompson is a clear number three, uh, the clear receiving back there, which also hurts Kelly's upside. But when you look at value, here's what's ridiculous: people are just hating on Rob Kelly right now. He's going 125th overall. Is running back 39 off the board. Insanity. 125th overall. Like he's going behind Alvin Kamara, Kevin White. Oh my God. That blows my mind. That's ridiculous. So he's going super late. Um, let me see where Chris Thompson's going. 184th overall, running back 50. Let me see if Samaj. Wow. Okay. So Samaj's actually jumped Rob Kelly by about 40 spots. He's going 88th overall as running back 30. So the fact that I actually think Kelly is gonna be the starter there, and he's going 40 picks later, it, it's a no-brainer here. I'm not even touching Samaje unless John uh, Jay Gruden comes out and says he's the starter here in Washington, which I absolutely don't see happening, but that's that. That's what I have for you. I guess the takeaways are I love Kirk where he's going as a later QB. I love Terrell Pryor. I think he finishes as a top 12 wide receiver, and I will be reaching for him in most of my drafts. I like Jordan Reed because you can get him later than guys like Gronk, and they have the same injury risk. And lastly, you have the running backs I just talked about. I like Rob Kelly, where he's going. He's just one of those guys, if you go wide receiver heavy early, you can stack up uh, Amir Abdullah's, Paul Perkins's, Rob Kelly's, all RB2 plays that have potential to uh, with upside, you know, so that's going to wrap up this episode. Washington Redskins, cheers to you. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, two questions. Terrell Pryor, top 15 wide receiver, PPR or standard, whatever you play in. Yes or no. And then who do you think wins the starting job? Rob Kelly or Samaj Perine? Big dogs out. I'm grabbing the fattest asses just to see him shake. I swear I'm too real to be. I'm too real to be living so fast.